Welcome back to the ARM convention and our next featured session of the day with Dave Rosenberg. Dave is brought to you today through the generous support of platinum sponsor Continental Cement. Dave is a former naval officer and president of several companies. Dave understands the difficulties of managing tasks and personnel. Dave's on a mission now to replace TGI Friday with TGI Monday. Dave is the principal and founder of Locked On Leadership, a consulting firm that focuses on practical and tactical results. He is the author of Locked On Leadership, the tactical business guide to creating a culture of consistency, courage, and caring. Dave is also a certified professional behavioral and driving forces analyst who has worked with over 100 companies in 13 states, arming them to achieve sustained and managed growth. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Dave Rosenberg. Failures in leadership have killed more businesses than any single business problem there is. But I want to take you back to a time when a failure in leadership actually got me killed. It's the early 1990s. I was tasked with flying a bomber escort mission high over the desert. I'm flying in the backseat of the second of two F-14s, and our job is to proceed the strike package into the target area and make sure there's no one loitering around who might want to ruin their day. We're flying in what's known as a high trail formation, which meant my aircraft as the wing aircraft was about 1500 feet above and 1500 feet behind the lead aircraft. And our job was to clear the lead six, which is fighter talk for making sure nobody sneaks up behind them. Now, this is an antiquated formation. It actually hadn't been used since the Korean War. And the reason is simple. While we could clear the lead six, there's nobody who was clearing our six. And so the bad guys could just sneak up on us, take care of us, and then move in on the lead. The formation had actually been replaced by what is known as combat spread, where instead of being behind the lead aircraft, we're actually a beam or side by side with them. And this way we could simply look over our shoulder, clear their six while they look over their shoulder, clearing ours as well. The reason we're in this old formation is that several hours prior to this evolution during our mission brief, our brand new executive officer, and for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Navy, that's the number two ranked officer in the squadron, the equivalent of an executive vice president. Well, our new XO, as we refer to him, had just joined the squadron. He had never flown with us tactically before. He hadn't been in a cockpit flying in a number of years. And he overrode our standard operating procedure of flying in combat spread for this high trail formation. So there we are, 25,000 feet, when we get the call from the E2C radar early warning aircraft, the Hawkeye as they're known. Two bandits, 170, 50 miles, Angels 4. That brief transmission tells us that we have two confirmed bad guys, bandits, south of us, 170 at 50 miles away, Angels 4 meaning 4,000 feet above sea level, which in this particular part of the world meant they were skimming right along the ground. Now the good news, we're flying the F-14A Tomcat made famous by Top Gun, and we had the most powerful airborne search and fire control radar ever put in the skies. Even to this day, we can reach out and touch somebody well in excess of 100 miles. So 50 miles shouldn't be a problem. Unfortunately, the bad guys knew this. And so they were coming in low to the ground and we were pointing our massive amount of energy down towards the largest target there is, Mother Earth herself. See, they knew by coming in low, when that radar hit them, it would also hit the ground behind them and reflect back and hide them. We called it hiding in the weeds because our radar scope would actually light up with all these false returns and we had to figure out where the bad guys were. Meanwhile, the E2 is counting down the miles as our pilots push the throttles forward and we start accelerating for the intercept. 45 miles, 40, no joy. 
the radar intercept officer and the lead aircraft and me are both working furiously at the radar, trying to find them. 30 miles, 25. Now the hairs on the back of my neck are starting to stand on end. And yes, I actually did have hair back then. See, we're now in missile engagement range and the bad guys can launch missiles on us at any time. And we have no idea where they are. 20 miles, 15, 10, five. Then I heard it, the words I never wanted to hear before without a confirmed radar lock, merge. That meant on the E2's radar screen, our image and the bad guy's image have become one and they can no longer help us out by telling us where the bad guys are. I immediately start looking over my shoulder, literally looking over my shoulder. My radar is useless at this point. Head comes out of the cockpit. I look right, I scan high, I scan low, nothing. Come over to my left side, I look high, I look down low. There they are, two bandits coming nose on. I jump on the radio, break left, break left, bandits, seven o'clock low. Immediately, my pilot pulls us in a hard 6G turn. We're trying to get the bandits to overshoot behind us so we could reverse and maybe get into a more advantageous situation. Unfortunately, the very wiliness that had us bandits coming in low also had them positioning themselves for the perfect firing solution. We found ourselves very quickly running out of speed and running out of ideas. And so we did the only thing any self-respecting naval aviator would do in such a desperate no-win situation. We died an inglorious death. Fortunately, this was a training mission. We hear, knock it off, knock it off, RTB, return to base from the E2 controller. Pilot pulls the throttles back. We tuck our tail between our legs and we start heading back home north to El Centro where we're gonna have a terrible debrief. My pilot, a guy by the name of James Heinlein, call sign Crunch. And by the way, folks, you know when your pilot has a colorful call sign like Crunch? They've got some history in their past. Crunch and I are complaining because this was just terrible. It's not that we lost the training. You train to lose so you can get better. You'd rather lose in training instead of real life. But it's how we lost. We lost not because we didn't execute well. We lost because our tactic was poor. And that was because our boss, a man who hadn't done the job in some time, overrode us, changed our SOP, our standard operating procedure to this old formation against our strongest objections. And the result was predictable. And the problem was, if this was real life, we'd really be dead. We didn't lost our faith in our leadership. See, leaders historically have been chosen because of their ability to help us survive. That was the number one trait any leader needed to have. And we got a very quick demonstration that this guy didn't have it. Now, my degree is in engineering, and I'm always looking for a way of doing things. And we react to the things that occur to us. And in this particular instance, what went through my mind was, I don't want to fail like this when I'm in his position. So I started thinking, what can I do? How do I ensure that I am always going to be an effective leader? And the answer didn't come to me overnight. And it took some time. Because the first thing I had to figure out was, what's my objective as a leader? Let me take you back a little bit. The hardest thing about flying in the back of an F-14 is not shooting down the bad guys. It's knowing which bad guys to shoot down. You see, in a complex battle space we exist in today and operate in today, the airspace is inundated with potential targets. You have other friendly aircraft. You have the bad guys. And then there's potentially neutral aircraft who are straying into the battle space because they don't know any better. And then part of my job was to see who is the high threat. The problem is, it's not who's the high threat to me, but who's the high threat to the mission. And the only way you can determine that is by knowing two key things. One, what is our mission? You might say our purpose. And two, what is our strategy to accomplish that mission? And with those two pieces of information, you can then evaluate who is the high threat to the mission. And then we would 
lock on to that target. All our radar energy would be focused on that one target. All the rest of the targets go away from your screen. And with a singular focus, you prosecute that target until it's no more. As business leaders, we have very similar situation. Every day, each and one of us is inundated with information. Some of it is important, other is not, and some is extraneous. And we have to sift through this to understand where we need to focus our energy. We use the same techniques that we use in the cockpit. You need to know your purpose, your mission, and you need to know your strategy. So to figure out how to be a great leader, I had to first develop what is my strategy as a leader. See, in the military, you go through a lot of leadership training, but it's similar to all the training you see in the rest of the world. It's what I call skill training, how to communicate more effectively, how to deal with conflict, how to make good decisions. But there's no overall strategy provided. As an engineer, I decided to attack this as an engineering problem because it really is a human engineering problem. And to look at any system, we need to first understand the extremes. So let's take a look at the extremes of leadership. And I don't mean of leaders, but of our team members. By the way, Minnesotans, thank you for Carson Wentz. Not working out for us this year. All right, so let's go on. Let's analyze the continuum of potential team members. To do that, I wanna take you back well before 1990. I wanna go back actually to 1974. I'm 13 years old. I grew up in Philadelphia. My dad was a school teacher. My mom, the most important job in the world. She raised my two brothers and I. This meant that we grew up in a household with an abundance of love, but not a lot of money. So at 13, I knew if I wanted to have anything, I needed to get a job. 13 is the youngest age, or at least it was at the time in Pennsylvania, for you to get working papers and be allowed to work. So I went out and I got my first job. I was gonna be a busboy in a Chinese restaurant, a couple blocks from my house, and this was exciting. Now, the good news is I had a job. The bad news, I had no idea what a busboy did. See, because we didn't have a lot of money, we didn't go out to eat a lot. And frankly, like most 13-year-olds, I wasn't concerned with the rest of the world. I had no idea what the people who were carrying those trays were doing. So I show up my first day of work, got my black pants on, my white shirt. I'm really excited. I get there a little bit before the start of service. And they show me where the plastic bin is. And they show me where to put the dishes away uh, in the sink so that the dishwashers can clean them. And then I find a spot. <sighs> And I stand there. Meanwhile, all the servers are setting place settings and setting the table settings. And I'm just standing there. There's no dirty dishes for me to clean yet. I have nothing to do. One of the servers, one of the waitresses comes over to me and says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm waiting for people to come in so they could eat and they could dirty their dishes. I could take them and put them away. She said, no, no, no. Help us set up the place settings. Oh, okay. I'll do that. Show me how. And she showed me how to do it. And off I went, helping the table, setting up all the place settings. I was done. I go back to my self-appointed position and I'm waiting. The doors open, patrons start coming in. The same waitress walks up to me. She says, what are you doing? Well, I'm still waiting for people to finish eating so I can clear their dishes. She says, no, you have to pour water in their water glasses as we seat them. Oh, okay. I can do that. I grab the pitcher of water. I go around to the people who have been seated. I fill up their water glasses. I go back. I stand there. Yeah, you guessed it. Waitress comes up to me one more time. What are you doing? I said, well, they're just placing their orders. I filled up the water glass. She says, no, I want you to continue walking around and just top off their water glasses. Okay, see it. Oh, okay. I can do that. Now, the first courses start coming out. People finish their soup course, right? Because that's what it is, Chinese restaurant, right? You always start with wonton soup, at least back in 1973. We didn't have hot and sour or any of that other stuff. Wonton soup, that was it. People finish a wonton soup. I'm standing around. The waitress says, 
you got it. What are you doing? I said, well, not, they're, they're not done yet. She said, no, take the dishes away as they empty. I think you got the picture, folks. I didn't do anything I wasn't told to do. I did no more, no less. No, I did what I was told to do as well as I could. But that was it. I had no ability on my own to figure out what had to happen next. As you can imagine, that job didn't last very long. That represents one end of the continuum. Let's contrast my experience and probably many of yours experience as well. When I was in the Navy, we love what we did. I mean, frankly, flying in the back of F-14s, best job I ever had. I got out of bed eagerly every day, excited, even if I wasn't flying, just to be around that. And everybody I worked with was motivated, a hard charger. We were serving our country. We loved what we did. It was exciting. We're always looking for ways to continue and improve things and make the squadron better. And there was a constant competition from squadron to squadron to squadron, which one's going to be the best. And we all did our part to see that our squadron was elevating the game. So now we've got defined endpoints for the continuum of workers. On the one hand, we have what I call the robot, the robotic me. The robot is that employee and we've all worked with them. You tell them to do something and they do it eagerly. The trouble is they finish their job. Most of them, many of them will just sit there and wait for additional instruction set. You know what that looks like? They typically look something like this. As they're smoking their cigarette, waiting for you to come up to them and find something else for them to do. Now, the problem with the robot is when something goes wrong, half of them don't even realize it. They just keep repeating the task that you assign them to do. And now a little problem that could have been solved very easily festers. By the time you find it, it's a big problem. That's one end of the continuum. The other end, those people show up to work before you do. They're solving problems you don't even know exist. And if they don't solve them, they come to you because they may not have the ability to solve them, but they come to you with potential solutions. Boss, if we could only do this, this would be so much better. There are people who are doing what they love to do, and it shows. The term for that is they are self-actualized. So now we understand the potential of employees. I have a simple question for you. Who do you want on your team? Do you want the robot me? Do you want that guy who is never going to do more than you tell him? Well, do what you tell him, but no more, no less. Or do you want that hard charger who's looking for problems and solving them, who's making your life easier, who's easily taking on more work and eagerly doing it, who shows up excited every day? If you're like me, you want more of them and less of these guys. And so now we understand our strategy. It's to create more, the term is self-actualized individuals, people who are doing what they're meant to do. And if we can remove the barrier that prevents them from being self-actualized and hiring people who have the opportunity to be self-actualized, then we can create high-performance teams. Armed with this information, the tactical and strategic objectives necessary to achieve this became crystal clear. You have to first understand what is meant by self-actualize. See, that's a term that was first coined by psychologists by the name of Abraham Maslow. And whereas you may not be familiar with his name, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. See, Maslow was what is known as a humanist. He was interested in normal human behavior as opposed to aberrant human behavior like Freud or Jung. He was particularly fascinated with this idea that some people got to work doing what they're meant to do. An artisan or craftsman who is sculpting or making beautiful things and they love to do it. But most people are doing what they need to do and not what they have to do. And he didn't understand why that was. And he developed this now famous hierarchy of needs, which is a recognition of what is required before people can actually look inside and determine what's needed for them. Remember earlier I said, we choose our leaders based on their ability to help us survive. 
Maslow's hierarchy of needs is actually a recognition of our need to survive above all else. Let's look at it this way. So Maslow's hierarchy consists of five different levels. The very bottom, you have our physiological needs, then our safety and security needs, then our love and belonging needs, finally esteem needs, followed by self-actualization. So let's test his theory. All of us together, we're gonna to magically put ourselves in the middle of the Pleistocene forest. This is primordial forest 300,000 years ago, well before civilization, when Homo sapiens first walked the planet. All you have is the clothes on your back, nothing more. Not what's in your pockets, just you and the clothes. You're by yourself. What's the first thing you're concerned with? I'm sure most of you right now are thinking to yourselves, I need food and water. And you are absolutely correct. Actually, it's water and food in that order, because you can survive a lot longer without food than you can without water. We have about three days. This is what Maslow called our physiological needs. We have a need to make sure we survive. And if you think about it, nothing else matters until we secure food and water, because without food and water, the alternative is death. So you'll take any chance, you'll take any risk to secure food and water. And what Maslow said is we don't even know about the next level of needs until we've substantially met the lower level. So you find yourself a freshwater stream and there's fruits and berry plants growing around it. So you have food, you have water. Okay, my survival in the near future is certainly assured. I can eat, I can drink. Now what do we have to worry about? Well, around this brook, around this creek, they're probably gonna have other animals coming and some of them are predators. You can't afford to get into a fight and get injured because if you're injured, you're gonna be less likely to meet your physiological needs. So now we have a need for safety and security. We have to secure a safe place to sleep so we don't get attacked in the middle of the night. We fashion weapons, right? We do all the things we need to do to help us be more secure and safe because the more secure and safe we are, the better it is we're able to meet our physiological needs. So each subsequent level of need supports the one below it. All right, we've secured our safety and security needs. What now? Well, if you saw Castaway, what is it that Tom Hanks' character did? He was on that island, he had food, right? He was relatively safe and secure, but he was lonely. See, as humans, we are pack animals. We are social creatures. We have this need of companionship. And it's not just to make us feel good, it's actually for survival. We are not apex predators. Alone in the primordial forest, by ourselves, we are probably not going to be the top dog. But as a group, it's a whole different story. I mean, look all around us, what humans can do as a group. I am coming to you from thousands of miles away because as humans, as a group, we put our minds to something. We are unstoppable and indomitable as a group. And we actually physiologically have hormones that help us connect with each other because it's a survival imperative. This is what Maslow called our love and belonging needs. So you start finding other humans. Now, we have a saying, there is blank in number. Right, safety in numbers. So by being part of a group, we're actually more safe and secure. We're also able to divide the workload necessary to find food and water and meet our physiological needs. So each level supports the next. All right, now we're part of a group. We wanna make sure our contribution to the group is being appreciated by the rest. What Maslow called our esteem needs. Now this is not self-esteem. This is not, oh, I feel so good about myself. Nuh uh No, we have a need for our contributions to the group to be recognized by the rest of the members of the group. In other words, to be held in esteem by them Otherwise, no freeloaders allowed, we get kicked off the island. So the next level of need that becomes apparent is now that we're part of a group, we need to make sure the group recognizes that we are contributing to the group. And that's done through reinforcements and through esteem. And what Maslow said is then and only then, once all four of those sets of needs are met, do we then look inside and go, what is it I feel like doing? What is it that's going to excite me? What was I born to do? And we have the opportunity 
to be self-actualized. Now, the problem is if what we're born to do doesn't support our membership in the group, we're probably not gonna do that. So now we also have our strategic objectives. If we wanna create self-actualized individuals, what we need to do is set up the conditions to allow each of those four needs to be substantially met. And hopefully the person at the end of that road We'll look to say, what is it I'm meant to do? And they're already doing it for you and your team. And when that happens, we become high performers and your team starts to excel. So let's examine each of those one at a time. The first level, simple, physiological. In today's first world country that we live in, we don't have to worry about hunting or farming, right? We just go down to the grocery store and we buy our food and water comes out of the tap. You turn a little faucet. There's almost no danger involved with that. And we have safety nets. So most people are going to eat. Very few people are actually going to starve to death in this country. So as business leaders, all we need to do is hire somebody and we've met that need. Check. We're done. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not so fast. We don't want to just hire anybody. It was Dr. Stephen Covey who's quoted all the time as saying, start with the end in mind. Remember, our goal is to have a team of self-actualized individuals, which means we have to hire people who have the biggest opportunity of becoming self-actualized, doing the work you either hire them to do or work they have an opportunity to do as they grow within your organization. So we have to hire correctly. We have to hire right. Now, I don't know about you, when I first got into business and I had to hire somebody, this was scary. I had no idea what I was doing. Oh, I had been through interviews. I had been interviews on this side of the table where all I had to do was answer questions. But from this side, where I had to ask the questions, not only did I not really know what questions to ask, I didn't have a clue what their answers meant either. So like many people, I did the best I could and it wasn't very good. I remember the first time I ever had an interview and hire somebody. Out of the Navy, my first full-time job was sales manager for a local telecommunications company here in San Diego. I was hired to build the sales force. They didn't have one. They had a few salespeople before me, nobody had worked out. So I got hired for the job. Of course, I had to prove myself first. So first year, it was just me, prove that I could sell. After setting a couple sales records, I remember looking at the owner to my first anniversary and I said, are we ready to start bringing on salespeople? And he said, go for it. And I said, okay, what do I do? I had never done this before. So he showed me the ads he ran and told me where he ran, ran them. Of course, this is before the internet. So yeah, we had to run them in newspapers, Sunday newspapers, and it's actually where you typically ran your help wanted ads. And I started getting resumes in and I'm looking at these resumes and I'm thinking, Who's done sales before? Well, let's just start there. I need a salesman. I'll hire somebody who's done sales. Now, hopefully I can find somebody who's done technical sales because that's what we were doing. But I'll take any salesman. I'm kind of desperate here. So I weeded through them and I started calling people in for interviews. I'm asking all the stupid questions that I had been asked. And they're answering these questions, of course, in the best possible light. Because we know one thing, if somebody is not smart enough to give you a really good answer in the interview, they probably failed the intelligence test. So everybody sounds good. How do I pick one? I need somebody. So I did what most of us did. I went with my gut. Who was it I connected with the most? Who was it that felt right to me that I enjoyed talking to the most? And that's not a bad starting place, right? They need to be part of the team. They need to get along with the chemistry. But just because you connect with somebody and they have a track record in your industry doesn't mean they're a good fit. There's a lot of factors we want to take into account. We need to know what are their behavioral hot buttons. In other words, every job supports different behaviors and every individual prefers acting in certain ways. It doesn't mean we can do other behaviors, but if we're not doing what our natural behaviors are, we're under stress. And there's tests for this. Now, I didn't know this back then, but since then, that's why I do disc analysis with all of my clients who are looking to hire 
I strongly recommend we do disk analysis where we actually create a behavioral profile of the ideal candidate and test people against it. But that's not even the most important thing. The most important thing we have when we hire people is what are their values. See, values are how we make decisions. Values are nothing more than our beliefs in hierarchical order, meaning the things we believe the strongest, that's our top value. That's what we call them values. It's the value of our beliefs. Every company has values. If you're a closely held company, private company, your values are the values of the owners. They're not the values per se that are written on the web page. Because if the owners, if their active owners have different values, their decisions will always be in line with the personal values, not the self-stated company values. So if you're a business owner and you're listening right now, do an evaluation. Are your personal values in line with company values? If you need help with that, let me know. I'm sure happy to, happy to help in any way I can. I have some great exercises for you there. But in the meantime, assume you know what your values are. Now you need to be able to test your candidates to make sure they share your values. Because if they don't, their decisions are going to be the same as their values and not as yours. The way I recommend we do this is really simple. We do it with scenario-based questions during the interview. You can't ask somebody, if you let's say your company value is customer service, you certainly can't say to us, do you value customer service? Because you know darn well, their answer is gonna be, of course I do. They don't value it highly, they didn't lie to you, but they do value it. So you need to know when customer service comes in conflict with another value, whether or not it's theirs. Let me give an example, real life example from one of my clients who is a managed service provider. They do IT support. They outsource IT to commercial contracting companies like yours. One of their core values is service. And so we developed an interview question and it looks like this. Imagine you're a technician working here, you got the job. It's 15 minutes before closing, your day's almost over, the phone rings, you answer it and it's one of our clients. It's a normal client, it's not a super big client, it's not a super important client, it's just an average client. And the voice at the other end of the phone identifies himself and says, so sorry, I know I should have called you a couple of weeks ago. We have a new employee starting tomorrow and we need their new computer set up by eight o'clock. Now you were just told by your manager, there's no unauthorized overtime, so you can't just on your own go on overtime and nobody else is in the office right now. It's just you. What do you do? The candidate's answer to that will show whether they value customer service or rule following or obedience, or whatever you wanna call it. Those two are in conflict right now. If they follow the rules, they're gonna have bad customer service. The only way to give good customer service is to break the rules. Since we don't tell them what the values are ahead of time, their answer becomes really informative. And of course, when they come up with creative answers, as some might, we always walk them down what I call a rabbit run, where we narrow them so they have to decide, am I going to go to the customers because it's going to take a couple hours to fix this issue? Or am I going to say, no, I can't do it till tomorrow. And I'm sorry, you can't have your computer at eight o'clock when you need it. Because after all, it's your fault. By the way, folks, that was the wrong answer if you wanted to get a job with this particular company. So what I recommend for each and every one of you out there who has to interview and hire a great team is go through each one of your company values and create at least one scenario-based question that conflicts that value with a different value that is not part of your customers. Obviously, you should have at least two and maybe even three for each one, but start with one. And once you have them done, go back and do it again. Because if you don't quite get an answer you're sure of the first one, it's nice to have a fallback question that's completely different that might reveal the answer to you. So now we've started hiring really great people. People who share your values, who have the right personal behavioral motivation to do the job you've hired them to do. We've met the physiological needs of our team. We just started on the first step. 
Maslow's second step is safety and security. Now, when I say that, for most companies, I have to turn around and say, you know, I don't necessarily mean job safety. Job safety is important, but if it's an office environment, that's usually not a critical thing. Obviously, for those of you in the trades, job safety is number one. And if you don't have a good, solid safety program, not a word of mouth, not one of those um, just check in the box because the state requires me to have safety, but you actually make safety important to you. If you don't do that, your team knows that. And they're going to hunker down and they're going to make sure they protect themselves instead of protecting the company. So you actually have to have a solid safety program in place. But I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir on this one. Nobody wants to go through the headaches of replacing people because they get hurt. But safety and security isn't just about physical safety. It's also about job security. In 2011, I was hired as the vice president of a moving company here in San Diego. I was brought in because the owner wanted to eventually sell the business and he was the sole manager and he needed help because when he left, the company would be more valuable if there was management in place. When I got there, I was responsible for inside operations. I was responsible for the sales, administrative, accounting, anything that happened inside the building. And we did have another manager, so I misspoke a minute ago. We had another manager responsible for operations, moving operations. As I started putting things in place to make us more systematized, to make it more sale worthy, increase the value of the company, because that's what I was hired to do, I noticed I started getting resistance from one of our move coordinators. Now, move coordinator was what we used to call inside sales. We did a lot of high-end moves. We moved a lot of Rancho Santa Fe and La Jolla. These are very wealthy areas in San Diego. We moved Tony Robbins' ex-wife. And one of my move coordinators grew up in Oceanside, California, which is north side of San Diego County. He had a sixth grade education. He was a former gangbanger who got his life squared away when he got sent to boot camp. He's all tatted up. He started on one of the trucks. But after an injury, we had moved him inside. This was before I got hired. And he was doing over the phone sales. And he had the whole ghetto patois thing going. Yo, what it is, word. And he's talking to our high-end customers. I was a little blown away by this at first. I couldn't believe we we're letting him on the phone. But I don't believe in making changes quickly. I want to understand how systems work so I make good, solid changes. Take your time, do it once, do it right. And very quickly it became apparent to me that while he might be uneducated, he wasn't stupid. He's actually a really smart guy, really good guy. And I knew if I could get him over to my side, then everybody else would follow him. He was sort of that quiet leader in the, in, the, in the office. The problem was every time I came up with a change, he'd fight me on it. And I'd have to work and work and work finally to get him to accept and adapt the change. And once he did, things started going smoother. Well, a few months go by and we're starting to get to know each other. And I certainly learned to respect the him and I, I hope he learned to respect me. It seemed that way. He started relaxing and joking around me and you know, it's just, just sort of a, a calmer, smoother environment. One day at our weekly staff meeting, we, every Friday morning we'd have a staff meeting, comes into the conference room. And his, his name is Rock, by the way. And Rock was like the old Rock once again came in, just kind of looking down, he's all grumpy and grouchy, sits in his seat, he's sullen, he's not jovial, he's not making jokes like he normally does. We go through our meeting and I'm thinking to myself the whole time, and I knew it was too good to last. He was just putting on airs, trying to get along with me, but man, he's got a lousy behavior. Or lousy attitude, I should say, I'm sorry. Lousy attitude. And I heard a voice in the back of my mind. And it was one of my first chiefs when I first got into this fleet squadron in the Navy. And I was responsible for a branch in the maintenance department, responsible for the uh, hydraulics mechanics, the ones who worked on the hydraulic systems. And I was getting ready to counsel a sailor who was in trouble. And my chief, he asked me, he said, sir, do you know what you're gonna to say to him? And I always knew to listen to my chiefs. I got lucky that way. I grew up with stories in Vietnam of first lieutenants and platoon leaders who didn't listen to their platoon sergeants and ended up not doing very well. And I thought, yeah, I think I'm gonna to listen to my chief. He's been around a lot longer than I have. And I said, oh, 
just going to talk to him about his attitude. Chief said, sir, can I make a recommendation? I said, absolutely, chief. What do you got? He said, you don't know what his attitude is. You think you know what his attitude is because of his behavior, but you don't actually know. The only thing you know is what you observe, his behaviors, what you see, what you hear. Do yourself a favor. Talk to him about you. Talk to him about his behaviors. So this memory comes back to me. And at the end of the meeting, I say, hey, Rock, you mind sticking around? I want to see what's going on. He says, not a problem. Everyone leaves the conference room. We close the door. He said, Rock, you don't seem your normal self. You're looking down, observable behavior. You're not smiling, observable behavior. You're not laughing and joking like you normally do. Observable behavior. What's going on? I don't make an assumption about he has a bad attitude. I mean, I did personally, but I didn't tell him that. I want to hear from him what's going on. I'll tell you, I dodged a bullet with that one. Wow. You can almost see the crease where the bullet went by my head. Because what he said next just blew me away. Now remember, he looks up at me and he goes, Dave, I just found out last night my youngest daughter has lupus. Are you kidding me? Now, here's what you don't know about Rock. Rock was making $15 an hour. This is 2011. Not a lot of money. He had four daughters by his wife. Two kids by his baby's mama. He was supporting all six children on $15 an hour in San Diego. He didn't have a lot of money. And now he has this really debilitating medical condition in his daughter. The good news, about a month before this, we had instituted a health plan. And I said to him, I said, Rock, did you sign up for a health plan last month? He goes, oh, I couldn't afford to take that money out of my paycheck. I didn't. I'm like, oh, all right. What do you need from me? One of the things I learned from my chief is that my job wasn't to tell people how to do their job and what to do. That was the chief's job. My job was to remove the barriers that prevented them from doing their job. And that was frequently not work-related. It was almost always things outside of the house. I remember I had sailors who would bounce checks because nobody ever taught them how to balance a checkbook. They I got checks in the book. I must have money in the bank. And they'd write checks to the Navy Exchange and they would come across my desk as they bounce. And now I have to deal with this sailor who now is in the hole. Or I'd have sailors who would buy cars that the payment was greater than their net pay every month because the finance agencies knew if they worked for the government, they were going to get the money. These are the sort of issues as a naval officer I dealt with. And it all came crashing back to me because all of a sudden I have this outside issue that I need to deal with. I said, what are you worried about? He said, I'm going to need to spend a lot of time with my daughter and I can't afford the time off. I said, well, I can't do anything about the PTO. Need time off, it's yours. Your job is safe. And I didn't say that with any th like th forethought. I just wanted him to know his job was safe. As soon as I said those words, you could see this tension in his shoulders. Relax. It was like a weight was lifted off him. I said, I don't know what I can do about the medical stuff, but I'm going to look into that. Meanwhile, you need anything, you let me know. We'll get it figured out. I've got your back. He walked out of that meeting feeling a little bit better. But the real magic happened later. See, I went back to my office and I got on the phone with our insurance broker and I said, hey, I don't think you can do anything about this, but I got to ask. And I told her what happened. Long story short, she called me back about an hour later and said, I got it done. If he wants in, we'll grandfather him in just like he had signed up a month ago. No questions asked. And I went, I found Rock. I said, do you want this? He said, yes. And we got him signed up. And his daughter's medical condition was covered by insurance, not as a pre-existing condition. Everything changed overnight between me and Rock. From being my harshest critic, the person I had to convince, the hardest to do. He became my staunchest ally. And whenever I came up with a change initiative, 
He was 100% behind me. Oh, we still bounce things off each other because that was our culture. And we're going to talk about culture in a little bit. And he just unilaterally make decisions because that's not how I operate. He had his input. But when I said, this is the direction we're going to go, whether it was their idea or my idea, it didn't matter. He was on board from moment one. I never got a fight out of him again. It changed things significantly. All because I had his back. Because I ensured the security he needed met his safety and security needs. There's one other thing that happened by me doing this, and you're going to hear this again. See, in addition to our levels of Maslow's hierarchy, our prehistoric ancestors gave us something else that was a survival trait. That as leaders, we need to capitalize on every chance we get. And that's a human need to reciprocate. Reciprocity. See, that's a survival imperative as well. As a small group, together, we knew that if I did something for you, you would do it for me. You would do something else for me. You would give back. We still feel this need today. I have my best friend, my closest friend, I've known him for 30 years, needed a hand when he was injured, just changing a simple locking mechanism on his mailbox. I went to his house and I did it. It took me 10 minutes. It was no big deal. He insisted on buying me lunch. He didn't need to buy me lunch, but it's this human need to reciprocate. So, of course, I let him do it. When I had Rock's back, his response wasn't just because he felt safe and secure, but out of this overwhelming human desire to reciprocate, he then had my back. Do for your team, make sure they understand what it is you're doing for them, and I promise they will return that favor. I was talking with Andy Julius the other day, and Andy mentioned to me, people like me more when they know I help them with their, do their job. That's that need to reciprocate. We've now met our first two levels of Maslow's needs. We're keeping them safe and secure by helping them the job. By the way, there are five other things you wanna to do to do this. I'm gonna say these real fast. And if you have questions, we can talk about these later. But these are the five must-have things that every business needs to have. One, you need to have an environment of corporate growth. In other words, people need to know your business is growing, not staying stagnant, because there is no staying stagnant. You're either growing or you're shrinking in business. There's no staying still. Don't believe me? Let's have a conversation. Number two, you need to have a clear, defined career path. People need to know how they can grow in your organization. And if they don't, you need to tell them. When I was at the moving company, we told guys if they wanted to get off the truck, they had to first qualify as a lead mover. And by qualifying as a lead mover, that opened up doors to other jobs in the organization. As soon as we did that, we had more lead mover applicants than we ever can have had before that because we told people how they can grow in the organization and we took a job and turned it into a career. That's why we need a career path. You need to have clear, well-defined, accurate job descriptions. In a recent study, it was shown that when there is a discrepancy between what is written down in a job description and what you expect people to do, that it creates stress in the environment and makes people insecure. It also undermines your integrity because you're saying do one thing, but asking them to do another. So clear, well-defined job descriptions, which tell people what is expected of them, and then the fourth thing is solid metrics. In other words, how much of it they need to do. And those metrics need to be controllable by the individual. Metrics set the basement, the minimum acceptable standard. And when you do that, you tell people, you can be self-regulating because you just need to meet this number. If the number is 10 and they're producing 11, people feel secure, my job's safe. And if it's nine, they don't feel secure, but they know it and they have control over it. We'll talk more about how you deal with that when we talk about esteem. Lastly, if we're going to do all of these things, we're going to give them clear job descriptions, give them solid metrics. We also need to give them good, formal, syllabus-based training that tests people at the end of each stage to make sure they understood the training before you move them on. This will also pay off dividends in the long run. It also trips that reciprocity need because you're investing time to train them right, you're setting them up for success 
by doing that and they will reciprocate by trying their best. Do those five things and you will have a solid foundation of safety and security. And now we can move on to love and belonging. I hate that term, don't you? It's really about being part of a group. As I mentioned before, as humans, we are naturally part of a group. As human beings, we want to be part of a group. In fact, there was a famous experiment done in 1954 along these very lines in Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. Researchers took 22 12-year-old boys who were complete strangers from them, uh, to each other, so no one knew each other, and spent three weeks in a Boy Scout camp outside Robbers Cave State Park, which is outside of Oklahoma City. It was a three-part experiment to test group dynamics and how two different groups will react to each other. But it taught us so much more. So let me set the stage for you. On day one, a bus of 12, 12 year old boys, yes, 12, 12 year old boys, no, it's tough to say, 12 year old boys were delivered to the Boy Scout camp. And on day two, a second group, each group was kept segregated. They didn't know about each other for the first week. And they were given exercises to help them bond. And in, in virtually overnight, each created their own unique group and culture with their own group dynamics and hierarchy. As we all know, as humans, we're always looking for pecking order. Who's number one? If we've done anything with other groups, we're always looking at who's the big man on campus, who's the last one. When I was in elementary school, for example, I was, if I wasn't Omega, was fighting for that next to last. I just wanted to move up, not in the last one. Because I wasn't very good at sports back then. We used to play this game called handball. So it's baseball, except for with a pinky, and you'd hit it with your fist as a bat. Otherwise, it was just like baseball. And I wasn't coordinated enough to hit that ball. So I knew I was going to get chosen last or next to last. That was my lot in life back then. That's how we are as humans. And these boys did the same thing. They created their own unique hierarchy. They created their own unique identities. One independently called themselves the Eagles without any prompting. The other became the Rattlers. And over the course of the first week, they became peripherally aware of each other because they were on the same camp and they started getting territorial. The Eagles claimed the ball field for themselves. The Rattlers had decided that they were gonna make sure every one of their members learned to swim because they sure the Eagles weren't gonna do that. Week one ended and now the researchers decided to put them in direct competition. They started creating situations where there could only be one winner and there was a prize for that winner and nothing for the loser. Not second place, the loser. This was 1954. We actually were allowed to have losers back in 1954. The two groups of boys hated each other. The first time they were shared a dining hall together, food fight broke out. Independently, each group had representatives go to the staff who were the researchers and say, we don't want to eat with these guys. The Rattlers stole the Eagles flag from the ball field and burned it. The Eagles raided the uh, Rattlers tents looking for prizes that they had won so they could steal them. It was ugly. Week three, unification. The staff wanted to see, the researchers wanted to see if they could put the groups together. So they did it originally, initially, by having get to know you events like joint movies. That didn't work out very well. Fights almost broke out. Food fight did break out. They all would segregate themselves and sit and yell and scream at each other. It was only until they put cooperative exercises together where the two groups needed to work together did the barrier start to break down. For example, there's a water supply for the camp was in the mountains above the camp and the the staff failed the water supply intentionally and then told the kids that vandals did something to the water supply and if they couldn't figure out what it was, they weren't gonna have any water. It took a couple hours, each group, the Eagles and Rattlers went out looking for it and finally they found this water tank with a rag stuffed into a pipe. Together, both groups worked on this problem. It took them 45 minutes to solve it. When they finally fixed the problem, the Eagles all had canteens. They let the Rattlers go first to drink because they were thirstier because they didn't have canteens with them. At the end of the exercise, there were 22 remaining boys. Four, uh, two of the boys had gone home already because of homesickness. 22 remaining boys got into one bus this time. 
And on their way home, the Eagles, who had won $5 or won in a competition, said, why don't we stop for malt for everybody? There was no more segregation. So a lot of great information came out of this study, but for us, the most important thing to understand is that we naturally form groups. And when you start a company, it's very similar to this. We have a bunch of strangers get together, and without any guidance whatsoever, they're going to form groups. When I worked at the telecommunications company, we had sales and operations. Many of you have probably very similar environments. Sales could have sworn that operations was trying to hurt us because we would sell based on what the technology allowed us to do because that's what the customer needed. And then they would complain and drag their heels or try and talk the customer out of it because it was too hard for them to do. And it was just because they were lazy. That's the only reason they did it is they were lazy. Of course, operations, those sales guys, they'll say anything to make the sale. They'll lie their faces off. It doesn't matter. We had two separate groups that were across purposes and the company suffered because of it. The owner actually tried putting together a happy hour so we'd get to know each other better. It didn't work. It was the same problem that the Eagles and Rattlers did when they had the movie night together. We sat at our tables, they sat at their tables. It didn't happen. The secret is you need to have a common purpose. You need to create a common goal and purpose that everybody is on board with. You need to hire to that common purpose. You need to talk about that purpose in your meetings. You need to make that central to your company. And by the way, that purpose is not internal. In other words, it's not inward looking. That purpose is not to make money. The purpose is not for the owner or bosses to have a good retirement. That is not why your company exists because nobody's gonna do business with a company that is self-serving, not what you find out about it. As organizations, as companies, we bring value to others. That's why they hire us. If, that, if your purpose is outward, how are you going to serve others? Then people will come together for that. When I was at the moving company, we went through an exercise where we spent weeks, the senior staff, the executive committee, four of us at this point, what is our higher purpose? Our purpose ended up not being to move people. Our purpose was to reduce stress. And when you hit your purpose just right, it resonates. See, the owner, when I started there, his name was Brian. Brian would do whatever it took to reduce stress in the staff. If they're having problems with their computer, he would drop what he was doing to see if he could help, even though it wasn't his expertise. We'd be in the middle of a meeting and his high school age kids would call and he'd stop and pick up the phone because they were having a problem. No matter how minor that problem may have seemed to me, it didn't matter. He wanted to reduce stress in his kids. Moving is one of the biggest stresses we all have in our lives, one of the top three. And so we focused our energies on reducing stress, reducing stress in our customers by doing things and putting processes and procedures in place that honored them, calling them ahead of time, bringing extra materials, right? The way we trained our movers to talk to them, never use the words stuff, junk. We didn't move your stuff. We didn't move your junk. We didn't move your... Yeah, you can fill in the blank. What we moved were your possessions, your treasured possessions. I once took a phone call from a IRA client because one of my movers took extra time to wrap this little basket. He said, it's a cheap $5 basket. You're just milking me for time. I said, let me ask you a question, sir. One, how are we supposed to know how expensive that basket is? Two, what if even though it's a cheap basket, it had deep meaning to you because it was given to you by somebody special and we didn't mishandle it. How would you feel then? We have to treat everything like it's treasured and valued. That was our purpose. What's your purpose? When you have a purpose and you let that filter through the entire company, everyone comes together, just like the Eagles and the Rattlers did, just like we did at Priority Moving. And you start creating your own culture around that purpose. You have a chance to create your own unique culture. It's going to happen. And the only question is, will you do it intentionally or will you let it happen on its own? Will you control it or let it control you? Because culture is nothing more than an outward reflection of your values. What does your office look like? Does it reflect your values? What does your organizational structure look like? Does it reflect your values? That moving company got sold at one point. 
I stayed with them for four months, as typically happens with senior management with the new owners. Shortly after the sale, the executive vice president and I were talking about a problem we had. I said, let me bring it up to the team at our Friday staff meeting. She said, no, 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 no. We need to have a solution first. I'm like, no, usually I bring problems up to the team and let them come up with a solution because they know it better than I do. That wasn't the new culture. I know when I was talking to Jerry Lang, he was talking about when he was at the Bowerly Brothers, it was a privately held company and they had a culture that cared for their team members as if they were family, which meant in the wintertime, they kept people on when they maybe didn't need to from a financial perspective, but it was important to them that they took care of their people. When they're acquired by Knife River, there's different imperatives, different values. It's not to say better or worse, just different. And the culture changed. Now, Jerry works with new companies, making sure they understand how the culture is going to have to change because there's some realities based with a publicly traded company that private ones don't have. Build your culture to reflect your values. And then you'll attract people who enjoy that culture. And they're gonna be more inclined to stay because people don't leave for money. They leave because they don't feel valued. And they don't feel important. And when they enjoy the culture, they will get rewarded by that culture. So now we have that sense of love and belonging. We're part of a group. We're almost there. Our team's almost ready to look inside and become self-actualized. But there's one last piece. We need to make sure they understand the esteem in which you hold each and every one of them. There are techniques that I recommend to everybody to ensure that the esteem is realized. The first is the most obvious, recognition. You know, if you look in the military, you'll see that people are in uniform. Obviously, I don't have it on my flight suit today because you don't wear them. A chest full of ribbons. And irrespective of the service, we all do this. We look at each other and we go, what's our highest ribbon? The highest ribbon, and typically are medals, by the way, just for those of you who aren't in the military. In the Navy, we wear all our ribbons. And then some of them represent medals. Others are just ribbons. And the higher they are, the more precedence they have. And we can tell a lot by somebody. And those represent many different things. They represent campaigns you've been on, Southern uh, Iraqi freedom, enduring freedom, uh, the Kuwait liberation, Vietnam liberation, right? All the way back, each major campaign is recognized. They recognize accomplishments, Navy or Army uh, accommodation, achievement medals, right? Which says, I've done something. They, Recognize our values, heroism, purple star, bronze star. They recognize sacrifice, the purple heart. And they recognize accomplishment, whether it's a shooting medal, right, et cetera. We recognize that on our chest. How are you recognizing your people? Oh, I don't mean you have to put ribbons together. It helps. After all, it's Napoleon Bonaparte who said, a man will fight long and hard for a little piece of ribbon. And it's true. There's a company in California, just outside of, in LA, they're called Snack Nation. They do snack boxes for businesses or for home. They recognize their staff with buttons. Yes, buttons, just like the kids. They came up with all these icons and they fall into the same category that you fall off, that, that the military did. They have campaigns. They have a particularly difficult product launch. They want to memorialize it. People have these campaign buttons and they put them on the back of their chairs. They don't wear them on their chest like we do. Right? Or milestones, you know, a, a thousand retained customers, or I hit my quota three months in a row, right? And they get recognition for that. The key with recognizing isn't giving them the little tchotchke. It's not the thing you give them, but it's how you do it. What doesn't work is recognizing people simply by saying, you did a good job. It's too vague. Do you ever have a boss come up to you and say, you did a good job, and you happen to know that you were goofing that day? What, do you, what, what goes to your mind? <laughs> this guy's, one, disconnected. Right? That doesn't help. It's, some people start to wonder, what can I get away with? But two, irrespective of whether you know you did a good job or not, physiologically, your brain sets off dopamine, the 
it, it's a hormone, dopamine, what we call dope, because it's that feel good. It's I've accomplished something. That's dopamine's purpose is to reward you when you accomplish something. And you get a little hit of dopamine for doing nothing. See, you get when you recognize things, you get more of what you recognize. And so when you give a blanket, you did a good job and somebody didn't, you're going to get more of not doing anything. The other problem is, what if somebody who was watching that interaction, who actually worked hard that day, goes, well, wait a second, they just got recognized for doing nothing. I worked my tail off. And even if they got recognized for working their tail off, they're going, I don't need to work that hard to get recognized. And so what happens is, instead of elevating everybody, you actually start pulling people down. Those hard chargers take their hands and pull the throttles back just a little bit because they don't have to be at full power. They could just be at half power and still be better than everybody else. Now, sometimes these people have integrity. They go, I'm not going to pull back. So they keep charging and charging and charging, but they're really not excelling, being recognized more than the other people. So now their Sunday changes. They move from relaxing with the family to jumping on and looking at Indeed or other job sites, wondering where they can go, where they will be better appreciated. So I have a formula for you to help you recognize people when you do it. You don't want to do blanket recognition. You want to use what I call laser guided praise. Laser is an acronym or a mnemonic. The L stands for limited to the person or people who actually did the behavior you want to recognize. Remember, we recognize behaviors, not attitudes, just like we counsel behaviors, not attitudes. So limited to the people you want to recognize. That's number one, limited. A, you want to make it about your core values. This is a wonderful time for you to actually reinforce the values of your company. You should bring these values up any chance you get, but especially when recognizing. Let's take the example of customer service. It's one of our core values. And you have somebody who does an outstanding job talking to an irate customer. You walk up to them and you say, Jane, you did a great job talking to that customer who is irate, specific behavior. You listened without interrupting for 15 minutes while they went on and on and on. Again, we're specific. You really demonstrated empathy, which is one of our core values and necessary for great customer service. Right? That brings up the S. We're specific. You want to be limited to the person, about a core value, specific to the behavior you want reinforced, and then the R, real time. To have that conversation four months after the event, doesn't do any good. Immediately, as a leader, you need to spend every day walking around looking, who can I recognize for what they did? Because the people around who hear that will understand, that's how I get attention, and they will start doing the same behaviors. You want to make sure you spend time with your people doing one-to-one -one meetings. These are not ad hoc meetings. I'm not talking about you got time to kill. You see John standing in the car. You say, hey, John, got a few minutes. I just want to talk to you. Hey, what's going on with you? No. You want to schedule one-to-one -one meetings. Really important. They are scheduled meetings. And the reason for this is simple. They say time is money, but that's not true. If you blow $1,000 today, you could make it back tomorrow tenfold if you were smart. But if you waste today, that day is gone and you will never get it back. You blow money left and right, I don't care, but when you waste time, it's gone forever. When you schedule a meeting with somebody, you say next week, I wanna spend an hour, you and me one-on-one, -on -one, just, you know, just gonna get, maybe take you out to lunch, which by the way, if you do a meal with somebody, really powerful way of connecting. Dinner is actually more powerful than lunch, studies have shown, but a meal is more powerful than no meal. But I wanna schedule time with you you now giving up one of your, your most valuable commodity for them. And that says, I am important. I hold you in esteem. And then use that time to connect and get to know about them as an individual. It will pay off dividends. They will feel valued and they will give it back to you. One-to-one -one meetings, recognition. The third, make sure you delegate. This is absolutely one of the most powerful things you can do to hold somebody in esteem. Because we only delegate activities to people we think are capable of doing it. But it has some other values for you as well. When you delegate, 
you actually are telling people you're worth it. At the same time, you're testing them how well they know it. But there's a specific way you need to delegate. When I was on my last deployment, I got called to the CAG's office. The CAG is the Commander Air Group. It's actually an acronistic term. It's now an air wing, not an air group. But I guess CAG probably sounds better than call. So we still call him the CAG. CAG is a captain in 06, just under Admiral in the Navy high ranks, uh, equivalent to a full colonel in the other branches of service. Yes, we have to be different in the Navy. CAG's responsible for all the squadrons on board a carrier. I was a lieutenant. I got called down to his office. He was a good guy. I used to fly with him when he'd fly with our squadron. I would fly in his back seat. So I wasn't worried. So I wasn't being called down to the principal's office. But I had never been called to his office before, so I didn't know what was up. And I go down there and I find out that we're doing an exercise and he wants me to plan the exercise. Normally, this is CAG operations responsibility, but he was delegating it to me. Okay. I didn't know what I was going to do. I took my, I accepted my orders and I left. Fortunately, there was a lieutenant commander, department head from our E2 squadron who had a tactic he wanted to try out. And he got me started in the right direction. And the week before the exercise, as I'm planning this out, I'm meeting periodically with the CAG, telling him what I'm looking to do and how I'm thinking about doing it. And he's asking me questions all along, not telling me what to do, mind you, asking me questions that got me thinking about, oh, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna get the right mix of jets on the aircraft? He asked me first, how many F-14s do you need? How many F-18s do you need? How many e, uh, tankers do you need? You know, what about the S-3? What's their role? Right? He would ask me all these different aircrafts. And I go, oh, okay. We only have limited space on the flight deck. How are you going to get them up there? Well, I, I don't know. Go see the deck department. I learned all about how we do elevator runs and what's required. It's not like the movies where you just get on and go up. There's a lot involved before that elevator goes up or goes down. What about weapons loadout? How do I get them out of the hold? On and on and on. I learned more about operations at that ship in that one week than I had in my entire six and a half years in active duty. It was absolutely, uh, simply amazing. When you delegate, you give it a chance to test people on their knowledge, expand their knowledge. And what this does is prevents the Peter principle. We've all heard of it rising to the highest level of, competence, of incompetency. When you promote somebody who's doing a good job to the next level and they're not qualified for that level, and now they're stuck doing a terrible job. Instead, delegate first, see where their weaknesses are. Then you can shore up those weaknesses and when they're ready, you promote them. Again, Jerry at Knife River knows this really well. When he was at the Bowerly Brothers, he delegated financial responsibility, p &L responsibility to his regional managers who typically didn't have that. Not only did it serve him well because he was able to spread his workload out, which doesn't mean he got to spend more time golfing. If you know Jerry, you know that's not the case. It meant he was able to work on other projects. It's like forced replication. It's like duplicating yourself. But at the same time, his managers got something out of it. One of them ended up replacing him as he got promoted. Each one of the ones who he delegated this responsibility to saw their career skyrocket because they learned the next level and were able to do it under his tutelage and make sure they understood it better before they were actually became fully responsible in their positions for it. Delegation is how you ensure your business will continue to grow and seize opportunities. You always want to create your replacement. So we built up esteem by recognizing the behaviors we want repeated. We built up esteem by giving of our time and making sure that people understand that they're valuable to us because we gave our time to them. We built up esteem by telling people, we want you to take on more responsibility because when you take on more responsibility, you feel better about what we think of you. But there's one other overlooked area that we can do consistently, but most people fail in. And that's simply this. You have to hold people accountable. Accountability actually builds esteem, doesn't destroy esteem. Let me say that one more time. Accountability builds esteem. 
when you hold somebody accountable properly, they end up feeling good about themselves. Let me ask you this. I know it's winter time now. You guys probably have snow there in Minnesota. In spring, your lawns start blooming. They start growing. Those of you with small children, how many of you, how many of you would ask a six-year-old to cut your yard? And if you did, and they missed a few spots, would you punish them for it? Probably not. Would you hold them accountable to it? Probably not. You probably would point it out to them, but you'd go fix it yourself. Why? Because we don't hold people accountable for jobs they're not capable of doing. We only hold people accountable who are capable. One more time. We only hold people accountable who are capable. So when you fail to hold somebody accountable, what you're really saying is, we are not, think, we don't think you're capable. And their esteem drops because if I'm not holding you accountable, the next step is like, I've given up on them, I'm going to kick them off the island. In order to hold people accountable, you need to cover four different things when you talk to them in what I call a counseling session. I got this from the military. This is what we call a page 13 entry. So in the HR jackets in the military, the page 13 is where we hold count, how we document counseling. There's four required entries in there. Number one, what they did wrong. This is where having good clear job descriptions with good metrics come into play. Because we can point back to that and say, you are responsible for doing this. Here's how much of it you needed to do. Here's what you actually did and why it fell short. And it refers back to that. Second part, what are the timeline for correction? You need to get your numbers up to speed by such and such date and time. A date certain, give people a deadline. Not just you have to improve, when? If it's gotta be a long process because they have a long road to go, give them intermediate checkpoints. Here's the progress we need to see. But let them know what's expected. Remember what I said before about people being self-measuring? One of my jobs growing up was in a restaurant in Pennsylvania, a fast food joint called Gino's. If you're not from the Northeast, you're probably not familiar with Gino's. Gino's was sort of a combination of KFC and McDonald's. So they had all the burgers that McDonald's had. They just had their own names. They had the Gino Giant instead of the Big Mac. They had the Big Sur instead of a quarter pounder with cheese. But they also had the KFC franchise. So they sold all the KFC chicken stuff. The first job you get when you're working in the back, is in high school, was in the drinks, the fries, the desserts, and the chicken. I probably shouldn't admit this, but I'm going to. Hard to believe, but when I was in high school, I couldn't tell the difference between a breast and a thigh. Seriously. So when I was making those chicken things, and I'm talking about chicken now, folks, I know what you're thinking. When I was giving out the chicken, sometimes I put thighs where they're supposed to be breasts and vice versa. And I started noticing my hours starting decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. I didn't think much about it. It just wasn't on the schedule that much. Oh, well. Until one day the manager came to me and actually counseled me. He came up to me and he said, Dave, I like you. You're here when you're supposed to be. You're reliable. But I can't use you if you don't know the difference between a breast and a thigh. You need to learn that. And if you don't, by the end of the week, I'm going to have to let you go. Guess what, folks? I now know the difference between a chicken breast and a chicken thigh. I could spot them from a mile away. It didn't take me long. Guess what else happened? As soon as that happened and I proved myself, I moved off of that station. Next thing I know, I was on the grill, which was a really cool job to have in high school, flipping burgers left and right. And then I got to go in the back and actually make the chicken. And I had more hours than I ever wanted. All because that manager held me accountable. Hold your people accountable. Does this work outside of high school? Of course it did. One of the jobs I had in the Navy was what is known as the legal officer. 
we're not lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. I don't even play one on TV. But I got four weeks of training in the Uniform Code of Military Justice and enough in administration so that I can make recommendations. And my job was to look at all the paperwork that came across, all the counseling sheets, all the write-ups, and all the reports, assign officers to investigate them, and then make a determination of what level it needed, whether it was going to be go to the skipper for the highest level we could do, which is nine... Um, uh, judicial punishment, NJP, we call the captain's mass. It's called Article 13, another branch of the service. Or is it just going to have a talking to? Is it going to be a written reprimand? Is there an oral reprimand? What? It was all my responsibility. And one day I get a report across my desk. And it was a young sailor. He had just joined the squadron. He'd come out of boot camp and gone through technical training to be an electronic technician. In typical military fashion, we joined the squadron after just getting all this $100,000 worth of education on how to fix electronics. We looked around and said, where do we need them? We need them in what we call the first lieutenant's division, which is Navy talk for, he was a janitor. Now, as you can imagine being an 18 year old kid after going through all this, being really excited about joining the Navy, seeing the world and learning how to fix and work on electronics and aircraft, to being told you got to clean toilets and bathrooms. Yeah, it kind of brought him down a little bit. So he was doing a lousy job. And we're getting ready for, we're doing workups, getting ready for deployment. We're working 18 hour days and his chief was having none of it. And he wrote them up. Now it's across my desk and I had to decide what to do. At this point in my career, I hadn't done a lot of counseling, but I'm like, this doesn't rise to level of anything more than me having a talking to and doing what's called a, a verbal um, counseling sheet. You still document it, but they don't sign anything. But what am I going to tell this guy? I mean, I get it. He's disgruntled. This is not what he signed up for. I'd be like if I signed up to fly and I ended up, you know, in submarines or something. That's not what I was there to do. So I bring in my office. And I remember my dad, who, as I mentioned earlier, was a school teacher. And he worked in a bad area in Philadelphia. But his students always did well. And I remember as I got older in high school and, and as young out before I joined the Navy, and I used to go to work with him sometimes and so how do you do it? Why do you have the success? And he said, the secret is connecting people with what they're doing to why it's important to them. Later on, I learned that everybody tunes into their own favorite radio station, WII FM, what's in it for me. My dad didn't know that term, but that's what he was talking about. Make people understood why it's important for them. How do they affect, how how's their actions not only affect them, but also the big picture of the rest of the world. So with this in mind, I sit down with the sailor and I said, I get it. You're not happy. You didn't join the squadron or the Navy to become a janitor. And yet here we have you in the first lieutenant's division. But I want you to picture for a second, put the shoe on the other foot. Let's assume you're in the shop. You're working 18 hour days like the rest of us are doing right now. At the end of the day, you're tired. You've been doing this for a couple of weeks in a row. You want to go to the head, to the restroom, to clean up before you go back to your barracks. You're going to grab a quick bite to eat and hit the rack go to sleep, wake up tomorrow and rinse and repeat, do it all over again. As you go into the head, you see trash laying around, the toilet stained, the sink and mirrors are a mess. And you just feel nobody cares about you. You go back to your barracks and you sleep fitfully because it's been a long, stressful day. You didn't sleep well. You get up, grab breakfast, you come into the squadron the next day, bathroom's still a mess. You're thinking about how this was a bad idea joining the Navy as you're working on the aircraft and you missed something vital. And that day, the skipper and me go up on a training mission. Something bad happens. How are you gonna feel? All because the guy who was cleaning the head didn't do a good job. On the other hand, let's reverse roles. You walk into that bathroom and it sparkles, it shines, it goes ding, like Mr. Clean himself cleaned it. And yeah, it doesn't hurt, but it helps just a little bit. You go, you know, the guys in the first lieutenants are doing just as hard a job as I am. They're working just as hard. And I, I feel like they appreciate the effort. And nothing bad happens. You just feel a little bit better about yourself. You have the ability to affect the morale of everybody in this squadron. What's more, what do you think the chiefs are going to do? When it comes time to say, I need somebody in my shop, and there's two or three electronic technicians in other spaces who aren't working in a shop, and they can pick any one of them. Who are they going to pick? Are they going to pick the guy that did a 
his job halfway because he didn't want to be there? Or the guy, in spite of the fact that the chiefs know you didn't want to be a first lieutenant, know you didn't want to be a janitor, they choose you any, but you did a great job and they choose you because they know if that's what you did in a job you didn't want to do, how good a job are you going to do in the job you want to do? So I had the conversation, I sent him on his way and that was the end of it. And frankly, I wouldn't even remember this story today, but one thing. About seven months later, we're returning from deployment. We stop in Hawaii, as we always do, to offload the weapons. Carriers don't come into San Diego with weapons on board. They're all kept at Pearl. Don't tell anybody I told you that. We're picking up something really important, though, as well. See, we pick up tigers. Yes, tigers in Hawaii. Not the animal. Tigers are what Navy calls civilians who are going to ride the boat back with us. It's our family and friends. I'm pretty excited. My first deployment, I didn't have a tiger. Now I do. My dad. As I said, I used to go to work with him, but this was his chance to come to work with me. He, we pull into Pearl Harbor. And they're flying in the next day. And we'd been at sea for a couple of weeks at this point. So that first night back into US territory, I don't remember a lot of it. What I can tell you is I saw the sunrise. And next thing I know, it's past the time I was supposed to pick up my dad and I'm not there yet. And I get in my Jeep when I rented and I race to the airport and I pull up front looking for sailors, just nobody around. And I asked one of the red caps there and they said, oh, they got Navy came in at the charter terminal around the backside. He tells me how to get there. So I get in my Jeep and I drive around the airport and I go around to the backside. And as I'm pulling up to the charter terminal, I see three people standing there. One in uniform, young sailor, two people, one of whom I recognize is my dad. And I pull up, my dad jumps in, I say hello to him, give him a big hug, good to see him. As we pull away, my dad looks at me, he goes, man, that sailor has a lot of respect for you. I look at him, I go, really? He's never worked for me. I barely know the guy. What are you talking about? Turns out that was the sailor I was just telling you the story about. And my dad proceeds to tell me the story that I just told you only from the sailor's perspective. And he ends with, he told me that you saved his career. That's the power of leadership. When you do your job, and you do it well. When you come from a place of caring and you care about others, you affect their lives and everyone else's life as well. So my call to you is do this. When you get back to your offices and you look at your people, ask yourself, what can I do to make their jobs easier? I don't mean do it for them, but what barriers and obstructions can I get out of the way? What training can I give them? How do I care about them? And I promise you, they're gonna care about you. Thank you.